So welcome to this tutorial which arose out of a question from one of the users who'd seen a video of mine on, on Vimeo and they wanted to recreate the effect at the beginning of uh, the Skyfall James Bond movie where you see the silhouette of uh, a woman dancing and there is smoke coming out of that silhouette as it were and uh, that was a rather good effect and he wanted to know how to recreate it in Houdini so uh, we're going to give that a go but the first thing we're going to do is have a look at this tune character which I've set up here and you can see straight away that I'm not much of an animator but uh, what I've done is I've given a little bit of movement sort of dancing type movement and the first step that we're going to need to undertake here is to render out some motion vectors uh, because the smoke that's coming out of the character is going to need to depend on how fast those bits of the character are moving. So let's uh, do that as a first step. And in order to render out motion vectors we're going to need a special shader and also some tweaks on the output node. I should say by the way that of course in the sequence from the movie, uh, they've created the motion vectors probably using a compositive program, compositing program, because their smoke is being emitted from a live action uh, video. Uh, and of course, what we're doing here is using an animated character. So the method will be different if you were using live action. Uh, although, of course, uh, you could use. A, a figure to sort of simulate the live action, follow along with the live action and create the motion vectors that way. Anyhow, that's enough talking. First of all, let's create our shader. And we're going to do this by creating a material shader builder. So let me just lay down one of those. And let's call it render motion. And let's dive inside and I'm going to open this up. So what we're going to do is generate some motion vectors and put them into this output. So how do you generate a motion vector? Well, there is uh, fortunately a function here, a, a VOP node, which allows you to get the position of the point that you're currently rendering at a specific time. Uh, so let's just render this in, uh, connect this in rather. And then we've got the original point position. This is the position at a particular time. This is the position at the current time. So let's get the position at the current time. And then let's subtract. So let's take the position at a particular time and subtract the position at the other time. And then we could just pipe this straight into the color output. Uh, but there's a problem with that because, in fact, this node here is going to produce the result of this in camera space. And we want it in normal world space. So we're going to have to do a transform. And we're going to take the input here. And let me hit P to bring up this. We're going to transform it from current space into world space. And then I'm just going to, for the moment, pump the output into the color there. Now, in fact, this isn't going to produce anything at the moment uh, because this time is the same time at which that point is, is being calculated. So the point that we get from here and this point are at the moment always going to be the same. So we need to add something. So let me add this and I'm going to add a value. So let's create a parameter here and we're going to call, select that. I'm going to call the parameter, say, time delta. So time delta means the amount that we're adding to time. And let's give it a, a value of default value of, say, 
So what this should do now is calculate the current uh, position of the point that we're shading um, and then subtract or rather subtract it from the value at the current time plus 0.1 and if the, the piece of geometry is moving there will be a difference between those two points and we'll get the result showing up as a color. Now you can also use an arbitrary output plane for this so let me just demonstrate how to do that. So we take a parameter and let's call this motion and we're going to give it a value of a vector and we can give it the, the, that default and we're going to always export it and we also want to make sure it's invisible that means it won't show up in our interface for our shader and we can just add that. Now that allows us to render this out as a separate image plane if that's uh, useful later on. So let me go up from that and if we have a look we should see that we just have our time delta parameter. Now if we just minimize this again and we need to make sure that uh, our tune character is using the shader, which it seems to be doing. Let me just check that, uh, that that's the right shader. There we go. So that's going to render out this shader. So let's just have a quick look and see what that looks like. Well, it's not producing exactly what we expected and there are there are several reasons for that which I will come on to. Uh, first of all let us get rid of these eyes which are not going to be very useful. So let me go into my output and I'm going to I'm going to lay down a mantra node which we'll call mantra render motion for example. And then on the objects tab here, what I'm going to do is deliberately exclude some objects. And the objects I want to exclude are somewhere here in the deforming geometry. Where is it? There we are. And we've got the left eye and the right eye. Let's just see. I think that that will ensure that the eyes are not rendered. Indeed, the eyes have now disappeared. So the next thing we need to do in order to be able to render our motion vectors is to make sure that we have motion blur enabled. And we can do that here on our properties, on sampling allow motion blur and if I then move to a another frame and let's render this out using the full renderer oops what we should find is that this is going to give us a, a result that's slightly more like what we were expecting. This is going to give us a result that's completely shite. And I'm just going to add one more thing in here. Let's move these off to one side and I want to add a multiply node like that and let's give that a parameter, select that parameter select that parameter, hit P to bring up this and we'll just create a scale attribute and give it a value of 1 and uh, that should allow us to adjust the size of this this result, which will be useful.
So if we go up and hit P again, we can see that we get our time delta and our scale. All well and good. So the next thing to do is to ensure that this is uh, applied to our character here. So let me actually go to the object. This is our character, this is our shading. And let's just make sure that, yes, indeed, that shader is now applied to our character. And now the next thing is to lay down an output node. We've got one here which is generated automatically by the, the IPR renderer. But I'm going to lay down a new one. So let's lay down a mantra node. And we'll call this mantra render motion, for example. So in fact, before we try that shader that we've just created, let's see what lo things look like with a, with a perfectly normal shader. Uh, and so I've actually laid down a clay shader here. So let's change the shading of the skin to clay. And let's go back and render that node. At the moment, this node just has the default setting. So let's just render it out and see what we get. And we can see we're just getting a very static image. There's no motion blur on this at all. Uh, and I've actually I'm on I'm on frame 12 here, so this this should be moving, uh, but we're not seeing any motion blur. And the reason for that is that by default motion blur isn't enabled in a mantra node, so you need to enable it. So you need to go to properties, sampling, and then allow motion blur. And let's render that again. And we're still not uh, getting any motion blur. There's no, there's no blur here. Uh, and the reason for that is because the renderer has no basis on which to, to calculate the motion blur. Uh, this is rather a, a complex topic, and I've done a separate video on it. But uh, there are two ways that Mantra calculates, possibly three ways that Mantra calculates motion blur. First of all, if you're object is just moving about and it's got some transforms uh, you're moving the object about but it's not deforming um, then motion blur will happen automatically because this parameter here transform time samples is set to two so that's telling the renderer to look at the transforms at an object level and um, what I mean by that is uh, these uh, well actually you, you can't see it but if I was to put down a normal geometry node, you can see you've got uh, parameters here which you can animate. And this is what I mean by transform animation. So if you were animating these, then uh, this would be covered by this parameter here, uh, transform time samples. There are this is set to two, so that's looking at the beginning of your frame and at the end of your frame and looking at the motion between the two of them and calculating motion blur for that. Uh, but this character, of course, is not animated in that way. It's animated using uh, deformations, using the, the standard character animation tools that Houdini comes with. So that isn't going to work. There are two ways that you can get motion blur to work for a character one of which is to create attributes, uh, the for velocity attributes on all of the points. And then to enable, again, let's lay down a geometry node. So you would enable here in the render tab sampling. You would enable this geometry velocity blur. And that would enable Mantra to calculate the velocity blur, that the, the motion blur, from those V attributes that you've got on your geometry. And in general, for example, for dynamic simulations, where the dynamic sy system calculates those V attributes automatically for you, uh, that's what you use. But in the case of character animation, you can't do that, because in general, you don't have those attributes. So you have to use this other uh, way of calculating motion blur, which is geo time samples. So we need to put this up to two. And this means it's taking a complete copy of the object at the beginning of the frame and at the end of the frame, and it's calculating how far each of the points has moved and using that to create motion blur. And that's it's usually disabled because it's quite a, a calculation-intensive thing to do and can slow down your render. But in this case, it's essential. So let's uh, render it out.
and we can see now, I don't know whether you can see there, uh, that we're getting some blurring on this on this uh, character. We can see that hand is now blurred. We can in fact compare it to the previous image. There we go, that's nice and sharp, and this one is blurred. All well and good. Uh, now the problem we've got is that if we were now to use this to render out our motion vectors uh, by applying the motion vector shader here to this to this character, we would find that uh, the motion vectors would be blurred here, that the, the blurring of creating the motion vectors is actually going to give you the wrong result because the, the, the actual color that you're using to store your motion vectors in is, is being blurred out across the across the scene. Uh, and that's where this parameter here uh, comes in. Uh, in order to be able to, to use that shader that we've just created, you do need to have motion blur enabled. But you also don't want to actually have the render showing the motion blur. And the allow image motion blur allows you to calculate the motion blur, which is essential, but not actually display it. So let me just render that to show you that. And we can see now we're back to an unblurred image. And it looks exactly like that image we were rendering before we switched on motion blur. But the point is that uh, because this is enabled, the render is now rendering motion blur. And that means our shader should work. So let me go into our shader again, because there's one other thing that I that I did wrong here. And on our transform node, uh, originally I had this set to position. And of course, what we're actually transforming is a directional vector because it's the difference between two points. So it's important to correct that. Very good. So uh, now if we go into our object and we set the shading to use that render motion shader and we go back to our output, we should find that we're going to get the right result. Let's render and see. OK, well, we are getting a sort of a funny result here. We're seeing some greens here, some blues here. Um, let's first of all press this, which will equalize the renderer, the render rather. Actually, that doesn't help very much. But we can uh, use this to look. And if we have a look at the, the row of figures there, that's 0.7 minus 0.198. Nine, that's how much the, the, the motion is. That's a different value there and a different value there. So that, those are the motion vectors. We've got a problem here, which is got our eyes showing up, and they're not being affected by the shader. And actually what I'm doing, I'm just going to turn those off, uh, because we don't, in fact, need to, to render the eyes. And I can do that here on the Objects tab. And if I go down here to Exclude Objects, um, and then we have a look at our tune character. And then right at the bottom here, we've got a tune character deform rig. And we expand that. And then we should see that we've got the left eye. I mean, control click, left eye and right eye. And I accept that pattern. So we're excluding those objects. And that should mean, if I now render this, um, that they've gone. And indeed they have. Let's just uh, set this back to, uh, to normal. So there we are. Um, we've got our motion vectors. And I can now render out uh, this 100 frames worth of motion vectors. So let me do that. And we need to output this to a file. So let's create a new folder called pick and we'll call this motion dollar f dot pick and I want to render the first 100 frames. We probably won't actually use that many, but uh, we can render that out. And we want to try make sure that this is a float. And that's fine. That's a float. OK, so I'll render that out and uh, pause the video.
So those have now been rendered out and I've loaded it back into Emplo. So we can see here we're getting the motion vectors and the brightness there shows you that uh, where the things are moving most. So now we've rendered out those motion vectors. I think we'll leave this video where it is now and then next time we're going to move on to how to generate smoke using those motion vectors.